Uh, so thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm Scott, and today I'm going to be introducing you uh, to a few different technologies that we have to help secure our websites. Um, we actually have quite a few options and things available to us, but often when I work in organizations, I find that people just haven't heard of these. Uh, there's not enough information out there about them, so today we're going to have kind of a high-level introduction to a wider range of different topics. Um, the first three on there are actually CSP, uh, we've just touched on SDS and heard a lot about that, and then PKP um, are particularly important, and I think that a lot more sites than we currently have on the internet should be deploying them. Uh, we were talking just earlier about a recent crawl I did of the top 1 million ranked websites in the world, and we're finding less than even 0.2% adoption of some of these technologies. Um, so hopefully, after I introduce some of them to you today, um, we can learn a little bit more about them and how they can help us. And a lot of these I kind of see as an evolution in how uh, security has evolved. So in a typical browsing scenario, we have the browser talking to us. So we're the host, we're the server in all these scenarios. And typically our efforts were kind of focused on the server. We patch our boxes, make sure our applications are secure, make sure that only the appropriate people have access to them. And our focus was kind of on this end of the conversation. Our responsibility is expanded out into the transport layer with the introduction of things like HTTPS to secure communications to <coughs> servers. And all of the technologies that I'm going to show you today, I see as kind of an extension of that reach. And what we're actually doing is we're reaching out into the browser and we're going to start taking control of certain functions and features of the browser. And we're basically bringing the browser onto our team. We're asking it to help us to secure this entire conversation end to end. Now, one of the things that normally happens when I talk about some new awesome browser technologies, people kind of sigh and say, oh, I bet browser support is probably terrible anyway. Well, the good news is that browser support isn't terrible. Browser support for most of these technologies is actually quite widespread. And even if it isn't, you know, we can still offer these technologies to the browsers that do support them. Browsers that don't support them, we simply ignore them. So we don't have to worry about browser support. It's good. We can use them. And the first, uh, the first three on the slide title that I want to talk about are actually what I refer to as security headers. And they're just HTTP response headers. And I'm going to be talking particularly about the three down the left hand side. There are some more down the right hand side if you want to do some further reading after this. But I think the three most important ones are towards the left end of this slide. So we're going to be looking at those in a bit more detail. And the first of these is something called content security policy. Now, content security policy was originally created to stop something called content injection attacks. And basically, a content injection attack is just some time when a bad person puts a bad thing into our website. The most common one that you've probably heard of is something called cross-site scripting. And in this scenario here, we can imagine this is one of our web pages, and an attacker has managed to place a script tag into the page. And it's going to load some evil script from evil.com, and it's going to do nasty things. CSP was designed and created to mitigate these kinds of attacks. And it's exactly what we can do with CSP. So in this scenario here, uh, you can see the script tag is loading from third party origin, but CSP can also help us mitigate cross-site cross scripting because it also blocks inline scripts like this. Now this script example isn't particularly malicious, all it's going to do is pop an alert on the browser, but you can imagine if an attacker gets the ability to put script into our pages, then they can basically do anything they want. They've got script execution in the DOM, they can do anything. They can rewrite the page, they could log keys, steal session cookies, they're only limited by their imagination. So we want to neutralize this with CSP, and we can. Um, and as well, so one of the things to know about CSP as well, sorry, is that because inline scripts like this are blocked by default, as I'm talking through this, bear in mind that we can't actually use any inline script if we want proper cross-site scripting protection. What we have to do is externalize script and load it from our own domain, or a third-party domain like a CDN. So all inline script is blocked, it's something to bear in mind. As I mentioned, content security policy is just a HTTP response header. For those of you familiar with them, every time you request a page from a website, you get a few HTTP response headers at the top, and it's just a way for the server and the browser to exchange some information. Uh, you can see here the content security policy header. Some of you may be familiar with things like cache control headers, uh, but you literally just issue the content security policy header on your page, and you put the policy that you want the browser to enforce on that particular page as the value of the header. Now the policy itself is made up of one or more of what we call the CSP directives. Now each one of these directives controls the location that the browser is allowed to load the appropriate type of content from. So the image source, for example, that controls where the browser is allowed to load images from. We've got the script source, that controls where the browser can load scripts from. They're fairly self-explanatory. 
So what you can do is choose one or more of these, and I have a basic policy example here just to show you what it looks like, and I'm using the default source. This is kind of the fallback. So what this policy says is that by default, I'm happy to load any type of content from myself and from this particular CDN. And this looks like quite a basic policy, but I guarantee you that pretty much no site, if any of you have a corporate site or your own site here, no one would be able to deploy this because it's actually so restrictive. I guarantee that people load content from more than just themselves on one CDN location. We load content from all kinds of different locations into our pages. So what you have to do is kind of fine tune your policy. So I've taken this policy and I've adapted it slightly. By default, we're happy to load content from ourselves. And what I've done is I've specified the script source which tells the browser where I'm happy to load scripts from. Now when you specify a particular content type, you override the default, so I've had to put self again, because we override it, we don't inherit. And then I put the Cloudflare and the Google CDN in there. So this tells the browser, this page is allowed to load scripts from these two CDNs. And what that allows you to do is this, you can have script tags in your page that are referenced uh, sources from these two CDNs. Any other script tag that tries to load script from another location would now be blocked. So going back to the earlier example of a script loading from evil.com, the browser would see the script from evil.com, see that it's not in the whitelist, and stop the script from loading into the page. And again, we can't have inline script either. So this is effectively uh, a neutralization of cross-site scripting risks. We can tell the browser where it can load script from, and it can't run inline script. But again, we've only defined a default source of just ourselves and a script source, so you have to kind of continue fine-tuning this policy and building this policy. And we call them source lists when we list them in the directives. So we list all of the locations the browser can load script from, and we go on through things like the style, image, uh, child sources, things like iframes, and you tell the browser all of the locations that you're expecting to load your content from. But it's not just actions where, I call them fetch actions, where the browser goes out to fetch content and bring it back into your page. So this is when the browser's fetching images, fetching styles, fetching scripts. What you can also do is control other actions of the browser. Now I've taken some more of the CSP directives here. So coupled with the previous slide, we're still only looking at kind of 60 to 70 percent of CSP. We don't have time to go into all the CSP. It's just too much. Uh, but I quite like the form action, and I don't see this deployed a lot. And what it allows you to do, as the name kind of suggests, is control the action that is permitted on a form. So if you go to a website, or perhaps you have a disgruntled employee, or someone somehow modifies the form on your site to post the, your user's credentials to a different location when they log in, the question you have to ask is, do you want the browser to be allowed to do that? Do you want your, 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 user, your users to land on your login page, type in their username and password and hit login and then have those credentials be sent elsewhere? What we can do is say to the browser, on this page, this is our login form and this should only ever be sent to us. And we can prevent things like this from happening as well. So we're not just talking about the browser fetching assets into our page, we're also talking about where the browser is allowed to send information out. Now, if you don't want your users to send their login details anywhere else, you can just deploy CSP with a form action. You can deploy CSP with one or more of the directives. You can turn on one feature, you can turn on 50 features. You can fine tune it to your particular needs. So even if this is the only one protection you want from CSP, still deploy it with just this one thing. The next one as well, frame ancestors. Some of you may have heard of the X frame options header, which prevents other sites from framing your site. You might not want your site to be embedded into an iframe on another page. What the Frame Ancestors, Frame Ancestors Directive in CSP does is the same thing, but it's more flexible because we can specify a list of sites that are allowed to frame us rather than just an on or off setting. So you can see here, if someone was to embed this iframe into their page and try and frame my website, depending on what the setting in Frame Ancestors is, then the browser will either allow or disallow that. And we can just fine tune this list rather than an on or off setting for framing. We may even have areas of our site that we want to be framed and others that we don't, like our login page, again, coming back to these sensitive areas on the site. On the login page, you can say, frame ancestors not. We don't want our login page to be framed. But you may have other areas of your site that you do want to be framed. So you can allow the browser to frame those parts of your site. These two directives block all mixed content and upgrade and secure requests. These ones are fairly self-explanatory. If you serve your site over HTTPS, then I'm sure some of you have heard of something called mixed content. If we have a secure page and then we're doing things like loading things secure images into that page, the browser will give our users warnings to say, you're on a secure page, but it's loaded insecure content. If you want to avoid the risk of having these errors pop up to your users, you can use these two directives, or one of these two directives. Block all mixed content does what it says on the tip. 
if you have a secure page and the browser came across this image tag, then the browser would just block the image because it's mixed content and it would prevent the user from getting the warning in the browser that we don't want them to get. But I prefer upgrading the secure requests. So this will see the HTTP asset on the page, whatever it is, image, script, style, it doesn't matter. The browser would change the scheme to HTTPS and then try and load the image securely. Now we can't guarantee that the image will be available securely. Perhaps the particular website doesn't have a HTTPS version, but at least we're trying the upgrade. We block the mixed content risk, that's gone, we don't need to worry about that. And if this image is available over HTTPS, then we fix the problem. And we're getting the browser to do these things for us. Now, CSP is quite powerful. And you probably get the gist that you can kind of break your website a little bit with it. If you accidentally block your JavaScript CDN or the location that you load all your style sheets from, your website isn't going to look very good. Unfortunately, CSP has us covered there as well. We can deploy CSP in what we call report-only mode. And you basically take the exact same header and policy that you want to deploy, but you add report-only onto the end of the header name. And what this says to the browser is, I would like you to take this policy and not take the blocking action, but what it will do is it will pop an error in the dev console to say, there was an image on this page that I would have blocked if this CSP was enforced. So you can deploy a CSP onto your test site, open the dev console, and as you click around, if your CSP would have destroyed everything, rather than the risk of actually destroying everything, you'll just get these nice little errors in the dev console. Now this doesn't scale very well. Nobody wants to kind of sit with a dev console open and fly around their entire website, especially if you have a particularly large website. And CSP can fix that as well. We have something called CSP reporting. So again, we've got the report only header. This will not take any blocking action. So if you accidentally block all of your styles, you aren't going to break your site. And you provide another directive called the report URI. And what this tells the browser to do is, if you would have taken some blocking action, I would like you to send me a report and the browser will post you back a JSON payload. So it will say, on this particular page, we had a script violation. Something violated the script source. It will give you the original policy, just so you have a reference point to what the browser received, and it will tell you where that script was trying to be loaded from. So if I was to receive this post request, this JSON payload, I know that on this particular page of my blog, there is a script tag trying to load from evil.com, and evil.com is not in my policy. It's not in my whitelist. So you're getting real-time feedback. These are sent by the browser in real time as it comes across the violations. If there's time at the end, I'll actually demo this working in real time. So you've almost got, effectively, real-time threat detection on your site if somebody manages to get cross site scripting payload into your site. Or you accidentally break something in production or push something to production that shouldn't be there. You're getting live feedback from your website, and it's actually from your visitors' browsers. So this fixes the issue of you having to manually test your entire site in that you're now asking your visitors' browsers to send you live feedback. So if they find a problem, they'll probably find it a lot faster than you, and you've effectively just recruited them all into your QA team, so you've got free QA. And the one last thing that I want to touch on on CSP, if any of you serve over HTTP and are currently involved in a migration to HTTPS, you'll know how difficult this can be, especially for larger sites. It can be really hard to complete that migration. There's a big push towards HTTPS on the web at the minute, and I've worked with some large organizations I know how difficult it can be. This particular policy here, in CSP, you don't even need to specify the domain name. You can just specify the scheme. So this says to the browser, all of the assets on this page by default should be loaded over HTTPS. If they aren't, send me a report to this address. So they're effectively going to scour your pages and look for any mixed content risks, any HTTP assets, and then send you feedback on them back to you in real time. So if you're migrating your site and you're waiting to flip the switch to make sure that all of your content is secure, you can use this policy in report-only mode so there is no risk, and you can get all of the feedback from your visitors in your production environments. This is a big help. If you're considering the migration, I'll make the slides available online. Have a look at deploying this. The next one of the headers uh, that I talked about at the start was something called public key pinning. And public key pinning helps us to fix the issue and what we call rogue certificates. So here, for example, I have two certificates for my domain. The one on the left is one that I applied for from a certificate authority, which is one that I got. The one on the right is another perfectly valid certificate, except somebody's compromised the certificate authority and got a malicious certificate for my site, a rogue certificate. They've gone to a CA, they may have hacked them or compromised them or successfully impersonated me, and they've somehow got a certificate issued for my domain. 
At this point, they can now impersonate me online. They could successfully launch a man in the middle attack, and the user's browser would give them green HTTPS, and all of the security indicators would be present. And there is currently, without PKP, no way for the browser to know that, because it's been issued by a trusted authority. PKP allows us to fix this. And again, PKP, much like CSP, is just an HTTP response header. You issue it onto your pages, you put the policy as the value of the header that you want the browser to enforce, then you send it as responses with responses to your pages. Now, PKP is a little bit more simple than CSP in terms of the number of directives that we have, uh, and we only actually have three. So we have the PKP, uh, the pin itself, so this is the actual pin that we want the browser to store. Max age is how long the browser should cache it for, and then include subdomains is pretty obvious. Do we want, if you issue this on your root domain, do we want to apply it to all subdomains of our site or not? And a PKP policy just looks like this. So at an absolute minimum, you have to have two pin values. Include subdomains is optional, and you have to have a max age. So this is after the browser has received it, how long it will cache it for and apply it to this website. Every time the user comes back, the max age is reset to the full value. Now the pins themselves are basically just a hash of our public key. Uh, there's a command there to run it through. Technically, it's a hash of what we call the SPKI, the subject public key information. But for the purposes of explanation, just think of it as a hash of our public key. So this is the actual public key in our certificate. And we're giving the browser a hash of that and saying, the next time you come back, this is the public key that I should be using. If you get a different one, it's not mine. And the only other real consideration with PKP is actually where to pin. So I talked about my, what we call a leaf certificate, which is a certificate that bears my domain name, but you can actually pin anywhere in the chain. So you can pin at the intermediate level, or you can also pin at the root level. Now when we talk about leaf pins, that's my certificate, that's my public key, it's issued for my domain. I said earlier, you have to have at least two pins in a policy. One of them is considered as your current live pin, and is the one that should match your site, and the other one is the backup pin. Should something happen to your live pin, you've got the backup to roll back to, to fall back on and say, okay, perhaps it was compromised, perhaps somebody stole it or got access to it. So you can throw that one away and move to your backup. You've got to have at least one backup. And if you're pinning at the leaf, hopefully that backup will be in a safe somewhere. So you will generate a key pair, you will pin this second key, so this is your backup, and you will lock that away safe until you need to replace your live pin for whatever reason that may be. Now the problem with pinning at the leaf, this is the most secure level to pin at, um, but you also have to be responsible for your own backup. Some organizations don't like that. There is a risk involved in that if you lose this key and then the other one is compromised, you are actually in quite a little bit of trouble. So you can pin further down the chain and reduce some of the burden on yourself. You can pin at the intermediate if you want to. So I'm currently using a Let's Encrypt chain. I could pin their intermediate key and then I could also pin a different CA's intermediate key as my backup. So if the Let's Encrypt Certificate Authority got compromised or they were taken offline for whatever reason, I could come to this other Certificate Authority and say, please, can you issue me a certificate? And the browser would trust that certificate because I'd pin the intermediate of that CA. So the browser would look at the new chain and say, okay, Scott's previously pinned this and said this is backup, so we can accept this new certificate. At this point, only these two CAs could ever issue for me because I pinned against the two of them. And this is actually what GitHub do. Well, GitHub do this at the root level instead. So I chain through Let's Encrypt down to the DST root, and I would pin another root, any other root of a CA that you want. So at this point, if I get a certificate issued for my site, the browser will check that it's come from one of these two authorities. So these two authorities can still technically misissue for me, but what I've done is I've reduced the attack surface from all 300 to 400 authorities in the world, including ones under the control of foreign governments, to just these two. So if you pick two reputable and trustable CAs, these two people are now the only people that can issue certificates for your site. And again, I, I guess that you probably picked up the fact that you could break your site if you get your PKP configuration wrong. So, again, we have a report-only mode in PKP. You can deploy this policy to the browser and say, test this out, don't actually enforce this yet, but let me know if things would have gone okay or would have gone wrong. And again, we have this report URI directive. So you can either have a look in your site in the Dev Console, or you can enable the report URI and actually ask the browser to send you the reports back. So you can deploy it in test mode. You can deploy these with no risk. So try them out, have a look at them, and don't be too worried about it. If you get it wrong, you'll just get loads of reports, and then you can see where you went wrong, rather than effectively turning off your website. Uh, that's the payload, the JSON payload, slightly different from the CSP one, 
but it will provide you the chain that it got served, and you can analyze these certificates offline if you want to, and see where you went wrong. But again, we're getting this real-time reporting. And the good thing with this is that if somebody did actually miss issue for you, if you have PKP deployed in production, and someone somehow gets a certificate for your domain, once the browser sees that certificate, they'll send you a report back. And from this, you can see which authorities issued it, and track it down, and take steps to have it revoked. Rather than the current situation, which is that you would have no idea, and somebody could be potentially impersonating you anywhere on the web. The next of the three acronyms that I want to talk about is something called Strict Transport Security. And we touched on this a little bit in the introduction. And what Strict Transport Security solves is the problem that, by default, your browser always wants to use HTTP when you connect to a website. So this is a communication between me and Twitter without HSTS having been deployed. I open my browser and I type in the blue part, twitter.com. And the browser will automatically fill in HTTP because the browser defaults to HTTP as its default protocol. What happens, I send that request, Twitter receives the HTTP request, and they send a 301 back, and they say, actually, we don't talk HTTP, we'd like you to come back over HTTPS. My browser will then honor that, and it will send the HTTPS request to Twitter as it was instructed to do so. And this kind of looks okay, but the problem with this is that the first two requests there actually took place over HTTP. So our browser was instructed to come back and use the secure protocol over an insecure protocol. That means an attacker can see this traffic, manipulate this traffic, or just actually take that and redirect and throw it away, because it was sent over an insecure channel, and we can't stop them from doing that. So we're actually telling the browser to be secure over an insecure channel, and HSTS stops this. And in that scenario, basically the attacker would just do this. So the attacker sits in the middle, it talks HTTP to our browser, and it talks HTTPS. So our browser never got the redirect, it's happy talking HTTP, and Twitter's talking HTTPS to what they think is us, but it's not. So the attacker can just sit in the middle and watch everything that you do. Say your username and password, see all of your tweets, and all the pictures of the things that you read. But STS, again, is just another HTTP response header. You issue it with responses for your pages, and you put the policy as the value. And again, fortunately, STS is quite simple as well. The only actually required value in an STS policy is the max age, and that's how long the browser should cache the policy for, very similar to PKP. Uh, include subdomains and preload are optional. Uh, include subdomains, again, does what it says on the tin. And preloading, um, basically, you can have your site actually built into the browser. Um, so you can, if you include the preload token, you can request to be submitted to the Chromium source, and you will actually be built into the browser as a HTTPS only sign. So the browser knows, without even receiving this header, that you'd be secure. And a policy just looks like that. That's the absolute minimum STS policy that you need to deploy. And that's the age that the browser will cache it for. Again, every time the visitor comes back, it will re up that cache back to the full value. So the earlier conversation with Twitter taking place with HSTS looks like this. I open my browser. I type in twitter.com, and instead of the browser actually defaulting to HTTP, what it will do is it will stop that request. Even if I, as the user, type in HTTP, click on a link that says HTTP, or use a bookmark that says HTTP, we can actually override user input with this as well. We can stop them from doing insecure things and force them to use HTTPS. So the HTTP request never leaves the browser. The browser just will not allow it. It will block any action or any attempt to action to speak insecurely to the site. And what that basically means is that our entire conversation with Twitter now takes place over, HST, uh, over HTTPS instead. And we can just throw away that HTTP request because the browser will never send it, and you can't get the browser to send it. So the browser now knows that Twitter wants us to speak secure, and it removes those initial two steps where an attacker can intercept our communications and get in the middle of them. And the last one that I want to talk about is something called sub-resource integrity. Now this isn't a response header, this is actually slightly different. So we're going to come away from the response headers now and look at SRI. And SRI fixes the issues that we have with third-party trust in our sites. In the, on our sites, I mentioned earlier, we all load content from a host of locations. It could be images from an image service, we have styles and things like scripts coming from CDNs. We have contents and content and assets coming from all over the place. And we're basically trusting that the CDN we use actually sends us the file that we want. So if we're loading jQuery from this CDN and we reference it from their domain, 
we don't actually know that they're going to send us the jQuery library, or that the jQuery library hasn't had something added to the end of it. We're just trusting them to send us the appropriate file and to not tamper with it. And that all works good and well until the CDN is compromised or decides to do something nasty. If they change the JavaScript file that they're serving, we don't know, and there's nothing that we can do about it. And this is what SRI fixes. And with SRI, basically, all we have to do is add two attributes to the script or style tags on our pages. Cross origin only has one value, it's anonymous, so you don't need to worry about that one. And then we have a new attribute called the integrity attribute. And this is basically a hash of the file that we're expecting the browser to receive. So we put in the SHA-256, and if you want, even the 384 and 512 hash value of the file, and the browser now has something to inspect the inbound file with. So to generate the hashes is simple, you can do it on the command line if you want, there's tools online where you can simply put the script tag in, I run one of these online, you put the script tag in and it will give you the script tag back with the appropriate value. So you don't even need to do this if you want. But effectively, you just cat it out, run it through your hash, whichever way you want to do it, and then base64 encode it. And these are the values that go into the uh, integrity attribute on the script tag. It's really easy to set up, and it's a one-time thing, because this, this version of jQuery should never change, and we don't want it to change, that's the point. So once you've actually put this script tag into your page, you don't need to come back and maintain this, there's no ongoing cost. It's a simple set and forget. And this is what jQuery would look like with the cross-origin and the integrity attributes set. So we've actually got the full values in there, and now what happens is that when the browser receives the jQuery file from the CDN, the browser will hash it, and it will check it against these hashes to make sure that it matches, to make sure that it's actually the file that we wanted. Because up until this point, we would have just accepted any old file. So now we actually have something to hold the browser to, and say, right, when you fetch this asset, check the hash, check it's what we actually wanted. So back to the scenario of our third-party trust issue, when we've got a rogue CDN now, they may have been compromised, somebody may be intercepting the connection, it doesn't matter what it is. We will request the asset from them that's been tampered with, the browser will check the hash, and then it will reject the file because it knows that the file has been tampered with. So we're still trusting the CDN to load our content, but what we're now doing is verifying the content as well. We're trusting a book verifying. And this is a crucial step. Um, so what I want to do now, I have some time, I'm going to do a couple of um, kind of live demos, I'm going to try and do a couple of live demos and show some of these things actually in action. Um, and instead of tabbing out kind of throughout, uh, I'm going to do it now. So let me just switch this over. Come on. So the first thing that I want to look at is going back to the beginning when I was talking about CSP. So I've loaded up my bank's website here, and let's check the Wi-Fi is working, I'll refresh the page. It looks like we're all good. So I talked in the beginning about content security policy and how we can stop malicious content in our pages. And I want to demonstrate a problem here with the Barclays banking website. So does anyone here work for Barclays? <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> I might have had to quickly switch the website I was going to use. <laughs> Um, so, you can ask them to pass it on. <laughs> yeah. Or they might get me out. <laughs> so I've just copied some script there. I've got a script payload in my notepad here. I'm literally just going to copy this script, switch back over to the Barclays site, and I'm going to paste it into the console. I'm going to hit enter to let the script run, and then I'll close the console so you can see what it actually does to the website. Now some of you may have heard of something called the Holland Shake from a few years ago. Well this script is now running on this particular page. And basically all it does, it makes the logo jump around, it plays some annoying music, and when it kicks in, it makes it on the page just go super crazy. And you can scroll through, and everything, you just randomly select elements on the page, and it starts doing really annoying things. Now, is there anyone that thinks that's a security risk? Is there anyone that would be, that would be worried if I'd just done that to your website, your corporate website? Now there's only a few people, and I can kind of, I, I see both sides of this, in that I've just done that to my local copy of the page in my browser here. This obviously isn't going to affect anybody else that visits the Barclays website, it's just my local copy. But what it does demonstrate is that if I can get that content there, the browser will honor it, it will run it, it will do whatever the content says, and if it says do the whole shape and go crazy, it will. Now I can't do the rest of the demo on the Barclays website because I would have to break the law, so fortunately we have another website and you just pretend I'm still on the Barclays website. 
This is a website set up by Troy Hunt that you're actually allowed to hack. So you can do malicious things to this site and not get in trouble because he set it up specifically <coughs> for that. So what we want to do is we want to try and get that script into the page. We want to try and get some malicious things going on. And I'm going to use something called a reflected cross-site scripting attack. So if I put, when I say reflected content, if I put OWASP into the search bar there, I submit that, that to the website, and then the content is reflected back in several locations. The string OWASP is now in the URL, it's been redrawn back into the search box and back into the string there. So I just gave it a harmless string like OWASP. What if I give it a piece of JavaScript? It will then take that piece of JavaScript and then render the JavaScript back into the page. And rather than type it all out, I just have a nice little URL here to copy and paste that does effectively exactly the same thing, except I've passed it some JavaScript. So it takes what it thinks is the search term, it renders it back into the page, and what it's rendering into the page is actually JavaScript. And I can now execute JavaScript and do things like pop alert boxes. Obviously, you would do something a lot more malicious than pop alert boxes, but it just goes to show that if you can get the script into the page, the browser will honor it. And this is what we can neutralize with CSP, because the browser would know that that script is not supposed to be there. Now, we can also do, if you want to do this, I'll tweet the link or ask me for it afterwards. You can also make websites do the Holland shape reflected as well. So again, I'm just rerunning the same page, and this time I'm actually passing in the Holland shape script reflected. And if you want to find me on Twitter now, actually, I'll send this out. Um, do not click this link. You can click it, it's fine. Honestly, like, <laughs> nothing bad will happen if you click this link. Um, so if you find me on Twitter now, actually, you can go and click on that link, and hopefully, I want to hear someone's device playing the Harlem Shake. Uh, my handle, by the way, is just there, at Scott underscore Helm. If you click on that link now, this proves that this is actually a cross-site scripting payload. If you click on it, the browser will start playing the Harlem Shake, and we'll hear someone's phone, someone click on it, we'll hear someone's phone or laptop playing the Harlem Shake, and you can completely neutralize this with CSP. Uh, I was going to do a couple of other... other there we go. So it works. That's proof that it works. And we can actually get the, the ability to execute script in this page. Now, I was going to do another demonstration. So this is reflected. You have to click on the URL. But you do also have the ability to actually embed the malicious script in the page. And I was going to use this website, but somebody uh, broke it basically right before my demo. So I can't click on any of these pages. But I was going to demonstrate the ability to put the script in the actual page. They have a comment section at the bottom of each of those pages and you can leave a comment that is a script tag, and then it just writes the script tag into the page. And then you don't need a specially crafted URL. You just go to the page, and it does exactly the same thing again. But I don't know if somebody knew that I was going to do this demo and intentionally trash the site beforehand, uh, but it's now been broken. So the next thing that I wanted to do this demo was the form action one. And I'm actually going to do this live again uh, and put my own credentials on the line. So I have a password manager on my laptop. I'm just going to unlock it now because it's timed out. And so basically, if I do the command backslash keyboard shortcut, any of you got one password? Put your hands, anyone use it? So you guys know command backslash is the keyboard shortcut. It'll ask me which credentials it wants to fill in. I click on them, it fills them in, it hits login, and I'm logged into the website. That's all perfectly normal. So going back to the CSP form action I talked about earlier, what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit this page. I'm going to look at the form action, and I'll, uh, I'll zoom in so you can see it a bit better, actually. And I'm going to delete it so it's not sending it to this particular site. This is my site, by the way, so this is legit. I've got permission to do this. I'm not doing this on someone else's site. Uh, and I'm going to change the form actually to evil.com slash stealpassword.php. Now, does everybody agree? Does anyone disagree that this would not happen? If I click submit now, do we all agree that this will actually get posted to evil.com? Does anyone disagree? Okay, so you disagree. Okay, so but we agree that the browser would send this to evil.com. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit command backslash. I'm going to select this account here, and I'm going to ask it to log me in. And what it does is actually nothing. So my password manager has filled in the username and password and hit the login button, but the browser didn't actually do anything. And if we take a look back down in the console, I'll zoom in for you again, the browser actually says, I refuse to send this form data to evil.com because it violates the following content security policy directive. So this is actually how it works in real time. If that was a legitimate attack, this was a corporate website, and someone had somehow managed to change that form action, the browser will actually save your users from sending their credentials to evil.com. Now, that's 
all I wanted to do for the actual uh, demos. I hope at least that they've been somewhat useful in showing you that we can actually get quite a lot of protection very easily from some of these technologies. Deploy them in report only mode. Don't go for crazy insane policy on day one. Just turn on one feature, test it out, see how it goes. Build on your policies over time. If you want any more information on any of these, I talk about them all very extensively on my blog, scotthelm.co.uk. And if you don't have any questions, just ask. I'm on Twitter all of the time, and there's a comment section at the bottom of every page. Hopefully, next time I do my crawl of the top 1 million sites, I want to see that the usage of all of these has gone up by at least a small amount. Thank you. Before we move on to questions, I've got first two questions. Okay. May I ask you two first questions? Okay. Uh, question number one. Ma the max age of HSTS. Yes. What setting do you recommend and why? When you start out, um, because there's no test mode for HSTS, you can't actually have like a report only mode, start it at 10 seconds. There's absolutely no reason that you can't start at 10 seconds. When I first started tracking GitHub and a lot of the other big sites, they all start at things like a minute. So just start it at a minute. If your website explodes and everything stops working, you can turn it off, and in 60 seconds, all of your browser's caches will expire, and it'll be fine again. And then just walk it up. <coughs> So if you look at some of the big sites now, like GitHub is a, a really good example because they're currently doing this. As they build confidence, they increase the max age. So start with a minute, then they go to 10, and now they're kind of a month or two months, I think, is the current one. You should be aiming for a year. Once we can walk that value up to a year and you have that level of confidence, then even if that browser doesn't come back to your site for six months, it will still be in their cache because it's cache for a year. So start tiny. Don't. A lot of sites try and deploy these things in, in like full insane mode and we want the best on day one. Don't take the risk. Just go for the easy way and start small and walk it up. Cool. Question number two. Remember I showed you the OWASP security knowledge framework? Yes. And there's a little caveat there which says HSTS may cause a uh, privacy issue because a site owners can track you without cookies. How does that yes. work? So basically, a lot of these security mechanisms can always be taken and turned against users. There are always ways to do this. And with the STS one, the particular problem there, we had to include subdomains directive. If you don't set that, STS only applies to the particular domain. So a site would register hundreds of different subdomains. And for each user, they would set STS on a random combination of the subdomains. And they can then analyze how the browser interacts with those subdomains and effectively fingerprint you by whether or not your browser has seen STS on a given domain. So if you've seen STS on a random set of the subdomains, you can basically tell who that, not who the user is, but you can track that particular user. So you can, you can if you want to, use these things maliciously, but you already have to be on the malicious side. You can't use this you know, in a third party respect. You'd have to have them on your origin to do that. So how goes on Safari? Because I had one, <laughs> <laughs> one question. It was saying, <clears throat> it's a weird behavior. It was saying that when they flicked on this thing, Safari was, it was supposed to be reporting only, but it was actually blocking it. That's, yeah. So, so hopefully, like a lot of the people here, I imagine, will know that the support for all of these kinds of things is better at that end of the slide than this end of the slide. I think that's <laughs> pretty much the same for about absolutely everything. Um, Safari has been notoriously buggy with a lot of these technologies. That's the browser's fault. That's Safari's fault. The technical previews that they're releasing at the minute have got full CSP2 compliance. And I've raised countless bugs in all of the browsers on the screen here. We are tightening these things up. It's just, you know, if the browser doesn't implement it properly, then they could break anything they want. We don't need CSP to allow Safari to break things. Yeah, if you're in a site where there's very little tolerance for, you know, for user by experiences, is the solution just to check the header and not to send it? So Dropbox, Dropbox do that. Uh, when I was doing my crawls, I was quite surprised with some of the results that I was getting, and I found that if I started changing and manipulating the user agent string and the requests, that they would actually send me different policies. So some of the big sites out there are doing customized policies based on the user agent. But enable reporting. You know, enable reporting and enable it in report only mode. So you will, if there are one of these quirks or the browser's gonna block something or something is broken, deploy it in test mode, deploy it in that report only mode and turn reporting on. So you never get to the point where you've actually broken something in production, you just get loads of reports back. And the problem with Safari was actually, even when we enable reporting, it was still Yeah, so I think, they, didn't they require the sandbox selective to be enabled in the yeah, policy? Yeah. That was the issue, that I, I raised that book in Safari, that was my bug. Any more questions? You, if the client is a having a proxy, for example, this former company, most of the proxy are strictly image. Okay, 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you suppose that it is just the vanilla client going straight, but it's not a always scenario. So the two Especially scenarios... If it's an enterprise application like the CRM or something else, yep. most of the users are anyway passing through the company proxy, and most of the company proxy are stripping for stuff. So the two scenarios, one, the first one is when we're talking HTTP. If we're talking HTTP, all of these things are useless because an attacker will strip them. We have to have a secure connection. If we have a secure connection and the proxy's still in the middle, that means they've got a router on the endpoint and they're signing on the fly for the quick traffic. The connection's compromised. We're in a compromised environment. You shouldn't be relying on any of this stuff. If they're decrypting the traffic and modifying the payload, then there's nothing that we can do. And none of these technologies are going to help you because we're, we're going into a compromised environment just and we can't fix that. But yeah, so if they're, if they're stripping this, then obviously we'll get none of the protections from you. But we can't, unfortunately, there's nothing that we can do about that. You've mentioned that for CSP you need to um, get rid of all the inline uh, scripts. How, how does it apply to event handlers, um, href, uh, funny things in the CSS that allows you to execute scripts and so on? So again, it's the same with event handlers. Uh, you need to make, there is a way to actually disable this protection in CSP and there is an unsafe inline directive that you can allow these to run. I would advise against not using that because we lose one of the biggest protections of CSP. So you can just turn this particular feature of CSP off. It's on by default. Um, but you can also accommodate it. You, things like your event handles, as you say again. Mike West has a really good blog on html5rocks.com on how to basically make all of your JavaScript CSP friendly. If you want to have a look at that, it's got all of the information that you would need on how to accommodate this. I was more asking about how bulletproof it are rather than how to... Oh, okay. As long as the browser's implementation is sound, then it, then it is sound. And as long as there's no ways to bypass our policy. A lot of people have released what they call CSP bypasses. They're not actually really bypassing CSP. It's just that the policy is too lax and they can get around the policy because the policy hasn't thought of all possible scenarios. So as long as the browser's implementation is sound, then we can rely on it. Obviously, if the browser has a bug, then we can't do anything about that. But as long as your policy is locked down properly and the browser is bug free, then this is a good solution. You just have to make sure your policy is restrictive enough. Well, <laughs> funny story. <laughs> Speaking about um, uh, weaknesses or ways of going around CSV um, browser plugins yeah. or add-ons. So at the moment, by design, browser plugins overwrite the pages mm -hmm. as intended. So, for example, if you download a file, um, sorry, um, some tools, sometimes they just install, install toolbars. These toolbars include add-ons, and these add-ons change the pages, sometimes even if you don't know it. So, is there any um, any way or any plans for CSP and future directives to sort of address that, or at least say which plugins are actually manipulating the uh, the pages? It kind of comes back to the endpoint being compromised again. If someone has a plugin on the endpoint and they've managed to take control of certain actions of the browser, there's very little that we can do externally. You know, it's, they have control of the browser; they're in the browser, so we can't come in from the outside and stop that. We have to rely on a, a clean environment at the other end. If that's already compromised, then you know, there's not anything that we really can do. You can, I wrote a blog a while back about combating ad injectors. So these nasty extensions that will do things like shove ads into all of your pages. But it's always the cat and mouse game. So CSP came out and these ad injectors would just blindly inject ads into the DOM and they would load their JavaScript and their styles from everywhere else. And the CSP would block that, so you could actually stop them from doing that. But now, because these extensions are in the browser, they can actually just strip the CSP header because they have the ability to do that. So they can take this protection out before it gets enforced. Because again, the end, they're in the endpoint. So unless if your endpoint's already compromised, then you've got bigger problems than CSP not working. Yeah. Hence. So, so yes, but no, there's nothing. There's nothing that we can do to go into that environment and make it secure. Not that I can see anyway. I'm not aware of any discussions. I'm tracking CSP. So CSP v1 and 2 are out of the v3 is currently a draft, but we do have some new things coming in v3, but not uh, nothing that would allow us to, to 
stipulate that to the browser. It's kind of similar to the proxy situation in that if someone's already in there and it beals to it, then they're in a better position. Thank you. Uh, can you talk a little bit of what's coming down the pipeline? In V3, a lot of V3 is up in the air at the minute. The biggest thing that I'm looking forward to, we have a new directive uh, called Strict Dynamic. So rather than having to whitelist all of your scripts, if you have, for example, a script that loads your ads, you can whitelist the script that loads your ads and then pass down the trust effectively. So right now, you'd have to whitelist everything. You can say, I trust this particular script and any script that it loads. So that will make your CFP deployment a lot easier to deploy. Rather than having to go through everything, you can just have this one trusted script that does other things that are allowed. There's other, there are other bits coming in CSP v3, but it is still, it's not finalized, so can't talk. The header size? Sorry? The header size? Yeah, so the other thing with CSP, um, I can show you actually, I guess. Um, you can probably imagine that you can actually end up with quite a big um, CSP header. Um, I run another site online called securityheaders.io, which basically just does HTTP header analysis. Uh, so if you scan my site, just to show you the actual raw headers in a prettier version. That's my content security policy and public keepings headers. They're huge amounts of data to add onto the top of every single response on your site, which effectively CSP needs to be on. PKP, you could arguably issue on less because the browser caches it. Um, at the minute, it seems that the only real resolution to this is HTTP2, uh, because we get header compression in H2. Um, but there is talk of moving these things out into kind of a manifest file. But again, there's nothing, you know, they're just talk, it's just talk at the minute. We're thinking, would it be better to move these out into a manifest file and have the browser fetch that asynchronously, rather than having all of this bloat in every response? So we are, there is talk of addressing these things, but nothing, uh, nothing certain. I think there's another question. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm just interested in, um, are you aware of recent developments in content security policy, that specifically the World Web Consortium's development and level three directive? So I'm, um, because uh, uh, this will, will aims to respond to quite popular, and actually whining that <laughs> CSP is quite difficult to deploy. Yes. Because it is, because it's based heavily on whitelists. So, um, so guys, you guys from um, web, web web app security working group uh, proposed to add on safe dynamic dynamic scheme. Are you aware of the? I mean, it's just make making it easy to deploy yeah. web app scripts and yeah. So unsafe dynamic has been renamed to strict dynamic that I talked about because we didn't like the unsafe flag at the beginning. Um, so unsafe dynamic is now actually strict dynamic. Um, and basically, if you have a script on your site that loads other scripts and you trust that particular script, at the minute you have to whitelist everything that it would ever load. Rather than that, what we're saying is we trust this script and then any script that it loads. So we, we can cut our whitelist down from everything to just one trusted script and then trust things that that script does. So it helps, it does make CSP easy to deploy. Question here? Yeah. <coughs> Actually, I have two questions. Uh, maybe the last. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The first one is: uh, Would the CSP policy override the same origin policy if it allows to load some scripts from different origin, and these scripts will, will change the page content? Because we know that same origin policy. Uh, it's really about changing the, the page content. CSP is applied before that. So CSP would just control whether or not the script got to be there. Okay. If CSP allows the script to load, then SOP would apply afterwards. If the script wasn't allowed to load, then obviously we don't need to worry about it because it, CSP would just block the script. Um, so it happens before that would be a consideration. Okay. Sorry, I'll just load back in. Second question. Are you saying there's a second question? Yeah, so the second question for the PKB uh, uh, uh -huh. header. I don't see that it will, uh, it will protect in the case of burn the middle attack, especially if it is in the first maybe uh, requests. So, yeah, so PKP and STS both suffer from what we call the tofu problem, mm -hmm. which is trust on first use. Mm -hmm. Because these policies are issued by our HTTP response header, you actually have to go to the site at least once to get them. So CSP, um, CSP is fine because it's issued on a per page basis, but STS and PKP, we have to get that first connection securely. If the attacker can intercept our very first ever connection to the site, then yes, technically they can get in. And that's actually what the preload directive in STS solves, because if you get your browser, uh, if you get your domain name baked into the browser, then um, you can't actually get in the middle of that first connection. 
Um, if anybody wants to see the preload list, I can show you later. Am I okay for time to do this now? Or do you want me to? Are we okay? Three minutes. So, well, three minutes, heck. <laughs> so there's a website called hstspreload.atspot.com. And basically what you can do is submit for your site to be included in what we call the preload list. And this preload list fixes uh, the tofu problem in that your domain name is actually baked into the browser. So you can put these policies into the source code of the browser. So it never needs to visit your site to get them. Oops, wrong page. Uh, it's that one. So if we have a look on here, this is the actual Chromium source. We're going to go look at the actual source code of Chromium. And they have the list of all sites that have been requested to be added. Now the Chromium source list obviously powers Chrome and Opera. And we know, and regularly, Firefox, IE, and Safari all pull this list and include it in their browsers. So if you get into the Chromium list, you get into pretty much every browser out there. And if we search this page from my site, so this is the actual JSON file that gets baked into the Chromium source. So my domain name is actually baked into your browser. Can you zoom into that? Yeah, sorry. So this is the actual source code of the browser. And what I've requested is the Chromium preload on the site, what we call preloading. You put the preload token in the header, that's proof that you want to be preloaded, and then they actually put you into the source. So now if you get a, a fresh laptop and a fresh install of Chrome that's never been on the internet, it already knows that my site is HTTPS only. And if you want, you can also preload your PKP policy as well. So even if the thing's never been on the internet, it still already knows this, because I'm actually rolled into the Chromium source. And once you get your SDS policy set up and you've locked it up to a year and you're confident, the next step is preloading. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much for the brilliant talk.